On a bright sunny day, a young woman experiences morning sickness and finds out she is pregnant with her first child. She is excited to share the news with her husband who works at a nuclear plant that is visible from her apartment. As she waits for her husband, devastating news surrounds her, according to which the nuclear plant has malfunctioned and it is about to explode. The woman tries to reach out to her husband, but before then they can evacuate, the radiation levels rise quickly, taking her husband's life and leaving the young woman alone with her unborn child. It is later revealed that the reactor malfunctioned due to the negligence of the workers taking the lives of innocent people in the city, and everything started one year ago. On April 26, 1988, in a dull apartment, Valery Legasov records his thoughts on the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. He expresses his disdain for Anatoly Dyatlov, believing him deserving of death for his actions. After completing the recording, Legasov adds it to his collection and hides it outside, evading detection by a car parked nearby, which constantly surveils him. Returning indoors, he checks his watch, finishes a cigarette, and prepares extra food for his cat. At precisely 1 hour 23 minutes and 45 seconds, he takes his own life. The scene then shifts to Pripyat in the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic approximately two years and one minute earlier. It's a meticulously planned community serving the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. In an apartment, Lyudmila Ignatenko, pregnant and experiencing morning sickness, smiles as she vomits, interpreting it as a positive sign. She proceeds to make herself a cup of tea with the power plant visible in the distance. Suddenly, there's a flash at the plant, followed by a larger, more intense one. The shockwave shakes the entire apartment as Lyad Miller returns to the living room, awakening her husband, Vasily. Together, they witness the power plant now ablaze, casting a blue light into the sky, prompting the town to stir with alarm. In the depths of Reactor 4's control room, we see Anatoly Dyatlov stunned into silence by the unfolding catastrophe. Upon hearing reports of a fire in the turbine hall, he deduces that the control system tank must have exploded. However, Foreman Perevochenko bursts in, claiming that the core has exploded. Dyatlov brushes off the assertion as shock, while Shift Chief Alexander Akimov, sensing the severity of the situation, tries to reassure Perevochenko that an RBMK reactor cannot explode. Despite Akimov's efforts, the control rod mechanism remains unresponsive. After this, Dyatlov departs to manually lower them from the reactor's secondary control room. As he exits into a nearby corridor, he notices shattered windows and black mineral lumps on the ground below but pays them little attention. As a distressed operator contacts the Pripyat Fire Department, Vasily is summoned to duty. Despite Lyad Mila's concern, he assures her that he's only dealing with a roof fire. In the depths of Reactor Building 4, Perevochenko encounters a scene of utter devastation. His attempt to gauge the radiation levels fails because of the limitation of their dosimeters as they can't register beyond 3.6 Renkin. Moreover, it is revealed that their high-range dosimeter had been obliterated in the explosion. Now, the severity of the danger becomes painfully clear when Perevochenko's colleague, Gorbachenko, reveals radiation burns on his face. After this, Perevochenko swiftly orders an evacuation and sets out to locate the pump operatives Valery Kodomchuk and Viktor Degtaryanko. However, he only manages to find mechanical engineer Alexander Yevchenko before succumbing violently to acute radiation syndrome, becoming the first of many to suffer this tragic fate. After this, Yevchenko takes charge of the search and discovers Degtaryanko outside the pump room, grievously injured with burns while Kodomchuk's body is buried under the wreckage. Returning to the control room, Dyatlov learns from Akimov that his attempt to lower the control rods was ineffective. Akimov informs him that two trainees, Viktor Proskuryakov and Alexander Kudryavtsev, have been dispatched to manually lower them in the reactor hall. Dyatlov then sends pump engineer Boris Stalyarchuk to restart the water flow into the reactor core to prevent a meltdown. When asked about the radiation level, Dyatlov dismisses the information, taking 3.6 Renkin as the accurate reading, describing it as not great, not terrible. Despite the escalating crisis, Akimov tries to reassure his colleague, reactor engineer Leonid Topchinov that they followed the correct procedures. As the fire department tackles the massive blaze, Vasily's colleague, Misha, notices a lump of the same black mineral observed by Dyatlov earlier. However, ignoring Vasily's warning, he examines it and experiences a strange pain in his hand. Meanwhile, Proskuryakov and Kudryavtsev encounter Yevchenko, carrying Degtaryenko's limp form. Realizing Degtaryenko's condition is beyond hope, Yevchenko agrees to assist them in accessing the reactor core. Holding the door open for them, Yevchenko watches as they enter the core, only to witness a horrifying scene illuminated by the lethal glow of the exposed reactor core. The intense radiation quickly incapacitates them both. 
Proskuryakov barely makes it back to the control room to report the reactor's destruction before succumbing to severe nausea. Despite the mounting evidence, Dyatlov still refuses to acknowledge the reactor's explosion, instructing Akimov to call in the day shift and inform the local Communist Party executive. Outside, Vasily steps in to handle Misha's hose after Misha collapses in excruciating pain. When a first aider removes Misha's glove, he discovers his hand flesh seemingly corroded by an unknown force. Meanwhile, Vasily observes several colleagues with what appear to be burns despite not being near the fire. In Pripyat, some of Lyudmila's neighbors gather on a nearby railway bridge to watch the fire, unaware of the radioactive ash falling on them. Elsewhere, Dr. Svetlana Zinchenko worries about the hospital's readiness to treat radiation sickness patients, finding it woefully ill-equipped and the senior doctors ill-informed. Meanwhile, Director Viktor Brukhanov and Chief Engineer Nikolai Faman arrive at the plant, furious that a routine safety test has turned into a major incident. Dyatlov insists they're dealing with just a hydrogen tank explosion, a roof fire, and a minor radiation release. However, Stalyarchuk realizes the true extent of the explosion and finds Yevchenko injured. After this, Yevchenko requests a final cigarette, and as firefighters douse the fire, water seeps into their room, revealing the devastation. Meanwhile, Stalyarchuk reports the reactor's irreparable damage, but Akimov, refusing to accept it, orders Topshinov to open all coolant valves manually despite Stalyarchuk's objections. Outside the plant, the day shift led by Deputy Engineer Anatoly Sitnikov watches the burning reactor for. They realize the situation surpasses a tank explosion, and Sitnikov learns that no one knows the radiation levels due to the missing high-range dosimeter. After realizing this, he heads to Reactor Building 2 to retrieve it. Meanwhile, Brukhanov chairs a meeting of the local party executive and repeats Dyatlov's assurances that what they're dealing with is nothing more than a mild accident. However, one of the executive members, Petrovich, openly challenges his claims, pointing out that the air around the reactor building is glowing and that several of the firefighters are obviously suffering radiation sickness. At this point, the executive's oldest member, Zharkov, delivers a rousing speech about how their job isn't to quibble about the extent of the accident and that with Mikhail Gorbachev himself having been informed of the disaster. Their goal should be to prevent any information about the disaster getting out of Pripyat, so that the people of the Soviet Union can get on with their jobs without having to worry about such insignificant things as exploding nuclear plants. After Zharkov's uplifting speech, the executive members leave the meeting with renewed hope. Sitnikov arrives to meet with Brukhanov, Faman, and Dyatlov, reporting that their high-range dosimeter malfunctioned, but they borrowed a mid-range one from the fire department. It is revealed that the radiation level is far higher than 3.6 Renkin, possibly exceeding 200 Renkin. In addition, Sitnikov's inspection around Reactor Building 4 reveals graphite lumps, indicating a core explosion. However, Dyatlov and Faman vehemently deny this possibility, leading to Dyatlov volunteering to inspect the core from the building's top. Suddenly, he vomits and loses consciousness, so Sitnikov is then reluctantly tasked with the job. As Akimov and Topchinov embark on their futile mission, Sitnikov faces a similar fate. Peering into the exposed core, he receives a lethal dose of radiation like Proskuryakov and Kudryavsev before him. Dyatlov is escorted from the administration building, revealing the full extent of the destruction in the breaking dawn. Soon, several firefighters, including Vasily, succumb to acute radiation sickness. Meanwhile, in Pripyat Hospital, Dr. Zinchenko is summoned as the first casualties arrive. Meanwhile, in Moscow, Valery Legasov receives a call from Deputy Chairman Boris Skirbina, informing him of his appointment to a committee overseeing the accident response. Then, the scene shifts and we see some children of Pripyat heading to school, unaware that a bird has fallen dead from the sky, a silent victim of the encroaching radiation cloud over the town. Seven hours after the Chernobyl accident, a radiation alarm in Minsk is triggered despite no apparent source. Dr. Ilyana Komiak, one of the few scientists on duty, investigates and identifies a nuclear fuel leak from isotopes in the air. She contacts the Ignalina nuclear plant, discovering they've also detected a leak, albeit at a lower level. Komiak then calls Chernobyl for information, but the lack of response slowly leads her to infer the dire truth. At Pripyat Hospital, overwhelmed with acute radiation syndrome cases, Dr. Zinchenko arrives at a grim scene. She orders contaminated firefighters' uniforms removed and disposes of them in the basement, suffering radiation burns to her hands. Outside, an angry mob, including Lyudmila, gathers who demand to know what's going on. In Moscow, Legasov attends a committee meeting and becomes increasingly concerned as he reads the dossier, realizing the gravity of the situation. However, the meeting begins with Skirbina downplaying the accident's severity to Gorbachev. Legasov objects, citing a passage about a firefighter burned by a black mineral, suggesting a reactor core explosion. 
Despite Skirbina's dismissal, Legasov insists on the true radiation level, far higher than reported. Gorbachev allows Legasov to explain the catastrophic potential of a core explosion and dispatches Skirbina and Legasov to Chernobyl by helicopter. During the flight, Legasov educates Skirbina on nuclear reactor operation. Soon, Komiuk arrives at the Belarusian Communist Party headquarters but faces dismissal as the party insists Chernobyl was a minor accident despite evidence to the contrary. Frustrated by their refusal to acknowledge the seriousness, she resolves to take action herself. Meanwhile, the mob breaches Pripyat Hospital where Lyudmila discovers her neighbors among the radiation burn victims. Determined to accompany her husband, Vasily, who is being transferred to Moscow for treatment, she pleads with the authorities and gains permission to join him. As the helicopter approaches the plant, Legasov is horrified by the blue glow from the core and the scattered graphite on the roof. Despite Skirbina's ignorance, he protests when ordered to fly closer, warning of fatal consequences. However, Skirbina's threat to the pilot prompts Legasov to emphasize the peril of radiation, convincing the pilot to defy the order. Upon landing at a military camp overseen by General Pikalov, Skirbina initially tries to give Brukhanov and Famin the benefit of the doubt. However, their suspicious denials and attempts to discredit Legasov only deepen his suspicions. When Skirbina questions why the roof is covered in graphite, Famin's feeble explanation fails to convince him. Then, Pikalov offers to use the high-range dosimeter himself, despite the risk highlighted by Legasov. That night, Pikalov bravely drives a heavily shielded truck towards the reactor ruins. Returning mostly unscathed, he reveals the shocking truth, the radiation level isn't the previously stated 3.6 or even 200 Renkin, but a staggering 15,000. Then, Legasov grimly explains that the reactor did explode, emitting radiation at a rate twice that of the Hiroshima bomb every hour, posing a lethal threat to Europe and Asia. After this, Skirbina promptly has Brukhanov and Famin arrested, disregarding their attempts to blame Dyatlov and seek solutions to extinguish the fire. Legasov suggests smothering it with 5,000 tons of sand and boron, but Skirbina rejects the idea of evacuating Pripyat. Later, at a hotel bar, Legasov lies to a worried couple about the fire's danger. The next day, helicopters laden with sand and boron fly towards the reactor. Legasov, watching from a rooftop, urgently reminds Skirbina that they cannot fly directly over the core. Unfortunately, the message doesn't reach the pilot in time, resulting in a fatal dose of radiation for all on board. Despite the tragedy, Skirbina orders the operation to continue, instructing pilots to drop their payload onto the exposed core. Meanwhile, Komiuk learns of the disaster and the authorities' efforts to contain it. Determined to help, she heads to the plant, despite its likely off-limits status. Meanwhile, in his Pripyat hotel room, Legasov remains unsettled by the lack of evacuation. When Skirbina tries to brush off his concerns, Legasov starkly reminds him that their presence alone has exposed them to enough radiation to likely shorten their lives to just five years, leaving Skirbina stunned. Their distress deepens when they receive a call revealing that radiation from Chernobyl has reached Sweden, prompting the U.S. to confirm the reactor explosion using spy satellite photos. Now, with West Germany taking precautionary measures, the Soviets can no longer justify keeping people in Pripyat. Soon a fleet of buses arrives, announcing the temporary evacuation of Pripyat. Citizens, including hospital patients, are ushered onto buses, leaving behind their homes, belongings, and even pets. Legasov and Skirbina watch from a rooftop as the once-bustling town empties, its residents departing forever. As the last bus departs, Komiuk arrives at a military checkpoint. Threatened with arrest for refusal to leave, she welcomes the opportunity, seeing it as a chance to reach those in charge. Led to Legasov and Skirbina, she warns them of a potential apocalypse. Meanwhile, the sand and boron drop to smother the reactor fire mixes with debris and creates radioactive lava. Legasov claims to have foreseen this, but Komiuk reveals a critical oversight. In two days, the lava will reach the presumed empty bubbler pools beneath the reactor. However, despite Akimov and Topshinov's failed attempts to cool the core and the firefighters' water pumping, the pools are now full, posing a catastrophic threat when the lava breaches them. Meanwhile, Gorbachev, busy navigating the fallout of the Chernobyl disaster and offering apologies to countries affected, presides over another meeting. This time, Komiuk is present to shed light on the harrowing situation. She carefully explains the looming threat. If the bubbler pools beneath the reactor aren't drained, there's a grave risk of a catastrophic explosion. This explosion, she elaborates, could be of a magnitude that would obliterate everything nearby, including the remaining reactors, and release a deadly wave of radiation that could devastate Ukraine and Belarus, make the affected areas unlivable for a hundred years, and severely taint Eastern Europe. In response to Gorbachev's query about why they can't simply drain the pools, Legasov provides a sobering response. 
He says that it's technically possible, but the task would likely result in fatal levels of radiation exposure for the individuals tasked with carrying it out. After a moment of contemplation, Gorbachev reluctantly gives his approval for the operation to proceed, recognizing the gravity of the situation. Finding volunteers for such a perilous mission proves to be a challenge. However, Skirbina's revelation of the dire consequences if the pools remain unchecked spurs some brave souls to step forward. Eventually, three technicians from reactors 1 and 2 muster the courage to take on the task. Yet, as they embark on what could be a suicide mission, their progress is swiftly halted when their flashlights falter, succumbing to the overwhelming radiation in the area, plunging them into darkness and uncertainty. With their flashlights rendered useless by the radiation, the three divers resort to using wind-up lights, which thankfully withstand the deadly conditions. Outside, Legasov and Skirbina anxiously await their return, knowing that failure would likely mean sending three more men into danger. Fortunately, the divers emerge from the depths, surprisingly unscathed, bringing a glimmer of hope in the midst of despair. Meanwhile, Lyudmila navigates her way to Moscow Hospital No. 6, where Chernobyl patients are being treated. After some difficulty with the receptionist and the attending doctor, Vitrova, who limits her time with Vasily and checks her for pregnancy, Lyudmila finally finds him. To her relief, Vasily and his fellow firefighters appear to be recovering with only minor radiation burns. Back at Chernobyl, Legasov and Skrbina clash over the establishment of an evacuation zone set arbitrarily at 30 kilometers despite detectable fallout up to 200 kilometers away. Skrbina defends the decision as being made at a higher level, frustrating Legasov, who accuses him of prioritizing party loyalty over people's safety. Their debate is cut short when Pikalov reports that the fire is nearly extinguished, but the temperature of the smothered reactor core is rising sharply, indicating a meltdown has begun. That night, Lyudmila wakes up when Vasily's health gets worse. He starts yelling in pain while doctors try to calm him down. Meanwhile, Skirbina calls Gorbachev and tells him about the new emergency. There's a 50-50 chance that the melted nuclear fuel will go through the ground under the plant and contaminate the water that goes into the river. To stop this, they need to build a machine under the plant. Gorbachev says they'll get whatever they need to build it. Gorbachev pledges full support for this plan, but Legasov interjects, asserting the inadequacy of the exclusion zone. Irritated, Gorbachev redirects the conversation, demanding a timeline. However, Legasov's sarcastic remark about plutonium's half-life elicits Gorbachev's abrupt end to the call. Then, Skirbina shoots Legasov a disapproving look before suggesting they take a walk. Amid the deserted streets of Pripyat, Legasov braces to be scolded but is surprised when Skirbina shifts the conversation to concern for the exposed workers and firefighters. Legasov somberly explains the grim trajectory of radiation sickness, from initial symptoms to cellular breakdown and excruciating death. He says that those exposed to lower levels will face a fatal cancer prognosis within years or possibly decades. Now, Skirbina's reason for the walk becomes clear when he reveals the KGB agents are tailing Legasov, highlighting the covert surveillance. Back at the hotel, Komiuk struggles to piece together the events leading to the disaster. Despite her efforts, she can't simulate anything worse than a meltdown, definitely not an explosion, and Legasov faces a similar challenge. He advises Komiuk to go to Moscow and talk to the control room staff while they're still alive. However, he warns her to be cautious due to her dealings with the KGB. Near a mine in Tula, Foreman Glukhov shares jokes with his workers about Soviet engineering quirks when Minister Shadov from the coal industries arrives. He tells them they've been chosen for a critical job at Chernobyl. However, Glukhov demands to know why they're being sent to such a risky place. Shadov reluctantly reveals the impending meltdown and the threat to Kiev's water. After this, satisfied with the explanation, Glukhov and his team head to Chernobyl, playfully covering Shadov in coal dust before departing. In Moscow, Vasily's condition worsens dramatically. With most of his hair gone and his skin unhealthy, he asks Lyudmila to describe the view from the window as his eyesight fades. Despite the mundane reality, she paints a picturesque picture of the city's famous landmarks. Meanwhile, Komiuk arrives at the hospital to question Dyatlov, who, though ill, isn't as affected as Vasily and his comrades. Instead of cooperating, Dyatlov rudely dismisses her inquiries. Meanwhile, the miners reach Chernobyl and Glukhov attends a briefing with Legasov and Skirbina. Legasov emphasizes the dangers of their task, but Glukhov criticizes him for suggesting that gas masks will protect them. By the next evening, it is revealed that the miners have made good progress, but the hot working conditions are challenging. Now, Glukhov demands cooling fans from Pikalov, but he refuses, fearing it would spread radioactive dust. Meanwhile, Komiuk finds Topshinov severely ill from radiation. Despite his condition, he agrees to talk to her. He reveals his young age surprising her, given his role in the reactor. 
Meanwhile, Vasily is moved to another room and Dr. Vitrova discovers Lyudmila has been there much longer than allowed. Lyudmila struggles to accept the severity of Vasily's illness but finally starts to realize it's terminal. She shares with him that she's pregnant, breaking the rules to be with him in his final moments, despite his deteriorating condition. As the mining work progresses, Skirbina brings some good news to Legasov and reveals that the fire has finally been put out. However, they receive an unexpected report that the miners, lacking cooling fans, have resorted to working naked. Legasov confronts Glukhov about this, but Glukhov argues that it won't make them any less safe. Glukhov then asks about their future well-being after the task is done, but Skirbina does not provide any assurances, leaving Glukhov disappointed but appreciative of their honesty. Meanwhile, Topchinov finishes his interview with Komiuk, revealing a massive power surge in the reactor core before the explosion. Komiuk is skeptical but confirms the account with Akimov, who is in a dire state compared to other victims. As Komiuk leaves, she spots Lyudmila inside Vasily's isolation bubble, her body language suggesting her pregnancy. Seeing this, Komiuk rushes Lyudmila out and confronts Dr. Vitrova, revealing the pregnancy. Angered, Komiuk vows to expose the hospital's incompetence, only to realize she's been overheard by KGB agents, halting her plans. The next morning, before another briefing, Skirbina informs Legasov of Komiuk's arrest. During the briefing, Skirbina assures Gorbachev that the heat exchanger is progressing well to prevent groundwater contamination. Legasov then outlines the extensive measures needed to contain the disaster, including expanding the exclusion zone, euthanizing animals within it, and constructing a containment structure around the reactor. It is decided that the General Tarakanov will oversee this operation, taking over from Pikalov. Then, Tarakanov inquires about manpower and risks, to which Legasov estimates a quarter million workers will be needed, with thousands likely to perish. After the briefing, Legasov confronts KGB Director Charkov, demanding Komiuk's release. Charkov initially feigns ignorance but relents under Legasov's insistence to take responsibility for Komiuk's actions. After this, Skirbina privately rebukes Legasov for his naivete, suggesting it's an asset rather than a liability. As Komiuk awaits release, Legasov visits her in her cell. She's shaken by what she witnessed in the hospital, particularly Akimov's condition. She shares the information from Akimov and Topshinov, suspecting a connection between the attempted shutdown and the explosion. Despite Legasov's discomfort, he encourages her to continue her investigation, although she won't be able to question the deceased Akimov and Topshinov. Meanwhile, Lyudmila leaves hospital number six, and her grief is evident as she accepts Vasily's passing. Soon, the bodies of Vasily and his colleagues are sealed in lead-lined coffins, then encased in steel coffins and finally buried in a concrete-sealed pit near the cemetery. Lyudmila and other widows watch tearfully as the graves are sealed, marking the tragic end of their husbands' lives. In August 1986, as the evacuation progresses around Chernobyl, an elderly woman defiantly refuses to leave her home, citing her lifelong residency and resilience through past hardships. However, a soldier forcefully removes her after shooting her cow, which depicts a stark illustration of the severity of the situation. Meanwhile in Kiev, Lyudmila, now visibly pregnant, settles into her new apartment, resigned to living alone for the time being as she awaits the birth of her child. Then we see Legasov and Skirbina talk to General Tarakanov on the daunting task of constructing a protective cover over the devastated reactor fort. They outline the hazardous conditions on the reactor's roof, with zones named Katya, Nina, and Masha, each with escalating levels of fatal radiation. To clear the debris from Katya and Nina, they plan to use retrofitted lunar rovers from the Soviet moon landing program. However, the extreme radiation in Masha poses an insurmountable challenge for existing technology. Now, Tarakanov is tasked with finding a solution to this critical problem. After this, we see Pavel, a young conscript, who arrives at an encampment near the Chernobyl plant, where he's assigned to work with two veterans, Bacho and Garo, who served in the Afghanistan war. Over vodka, the veterans discuss the severity of the situation, realizing the gravity of recruiting civilians like Pavel. They disclose their duty of euthanizing animals in the exclusion zone, many of which are beloved pets, highlighting the grim reality of their task. Meanwhile, the adapted lunar rovers prove effective in clearing debris from the radioactive zones Katya and Nina. However, the highly irradiated Masha area presents a challenge. Now, General Tarakanov proposes a solution using a German bomb disposal robot, despite its origin likely complicating negotiations due to political tensions. Meanwhile, Komiya continues her investigation, requesting technical specifications of the RBMK design. However, she receives only one heavily redacted document, raising suspicions of a cover-up. Visiting Dyatlov, who is still in denial, she confronts him with evidence of the reactor's destruction. 
Dyatlov admits ignorance about potential faults in the reactor design, expressing resignation to state suppression and a predetermined trial outcome, hinting at a systemic cover-up. After this, Komiuk leaves with more questions than answers but realizes that even experienced insiders like Dyatlov may be unaware of critical information. As Pavel, Bacho, and Garo head out for their cleanup job, they chat about the tough rules for radiation exposure. Bacho explains that once they reach a certain limit, nobody checks anymore, showing how much they're willing to risk to get the job done. When they get to the abandoned village, Bacho teaches Pavel how to use his gun, but also to do it humanely when it comes to the animals they're supposed to put down. But when Pavel has to shoot a dog, he can't do it right, and Bacho has to finish the job. It's tough for Pavel, but Bacho helps him understand it's part of their duty. During a break, Bacho shares his own story of killing, trying to show Pavel that it's something soldiers often have to deal with. Garo thinks about the big banner nearby that talks about making people happy, but their job feels far from that. Despite the deep thoughts, they know they have to get back to work. By September 1986, the cleanup is going okay, but then the robot they had hoped would help, called Joker, fails quickly on the most dangerous part of the job. Skirbina gets really mad when he finds out that the information given to West Germany is wrong, making things even more difficult. Now, they discuss other options like dropping heavy stuff or using explosive bullets, but none of them seem safe. Finally, they agree that humans will have to do the job even though it's really risky. Meanwhile, Pavel continues his grim task in yet another village, but just when he thinks it couldn't get any worse, he stumbles upon a mother dog with her newborn puppies. Even Baccio, hardened by his experiences, can't bring himself to ask Pavel to do what needs to be done, so he sends Pavel away while he deals with the situation himself. Pavel walks away, feeling numb as the sound of gunshots and cries fills the air. Later, the trio buries the pile of dead animals in a pit, covering it with concrete. In October 1986, General Tarakanov talks to a new group of bio-robots on their dangerous mission. He says that they must go to the roof of Reactor 4 with only 90 seconds to gather and toss as much debris as they can into the reactor core. Then, one of the soldiers is shown, whose face remains unseen as he struggles to lift the heavy and hazardous debris with his shovel. When the time is up, he finds his foot trapped under a large piece of graphite, delaying his return to safety. Back inside, he discovers a tear in his protective gear, signaling a high level of radiation exposure. Seeing this, the attending officer tells him it's time for decontamination, but the soldier knows that his future is now uncertain with his health at serious risk. In the next scene, the time shifts to December 1986. Lyad Mila finds herself in a park near her apartment in Kiev when she suddenly feels the onset of labor. Before she can seek assistance, she collapses in agony, indicating a serious problem. Meanwhile, in an abandoned schoolhouse in Pripyat, Legasov, Skirbina, and Komiuk gather secretly to discuss Legasov's upcoming speech at an international conference in Vienna. Komiuk reveals that the Chernobyl plant management violated safety regulations likely contributing to the explosion, but she remains uncertain of the exact cause, suspecting a flaw with the AZ-5 button. Legasov finally admits knowing about the flaw, which causes the reactor's graphite tips to accelerate the reaction briefly before Boron stops it. However, he's been instructed to blame Dyatlov, Brukhanov, and Famin, setting the stage for their trial. Now, Komiuk urges Legasov to tell the full truth to prevent future disasters even if it risks retaliation from the government. She shares Lyad Mila's tragic loss of her newborn daughter due to radiation exposure, questioning the worth of protecting a country that allows such tragedies. Nearby, the final group of bio-robots completes the debris clearance on the roof, earning commendations from General Tarakanov. Meanwhile, a disillusioned Pavel smokes a cigarette in silence. Then, a Kiev maternity ward is shown where we see new mothers embrace their babies, but Lyad Millis sits alone by an empty crib, visibly shattered by grief and loss.